Good evening, everybody. Let's get this hoop man started. A couple things before we start. First of all, thank you all for being here on this lovely evening. Secondly, when all this is over, we would love your help putting these chairs away and tearing these tents down. It takes hours to put this all up, and it takes about 10 minutes to get it all down. Uh, third, the Nebraska Chamber Players are rehearsing in the sanctuary. You don't have to be silent or behave, but just remember that. Please stay out of the sanctuary. When we're done, if you just want to stack the chairs in the fireplace room, we'll do it because they'll probably still be rehearsing. So I want to start by telling a little story about a, a woman that was very close to me. She was born in Kentucky on a mountain on February 5th of 1938. And that was my grandmother. She was born on into a house that had a dirt floor, like a legitimate dirt floor. And she used to take my brother and I up to this place called Bailey's Country Store in Williamsburg, Kentucky. And in Bailey's Country Store, they had a pair of overalls on the walls about the size of this side of this building right here. And there was a sign that said, if you can fit into these overalls, you can have anything you want in this store. And I keep trying, but I still don't fit in those overalls. But every weekend they would have a bluegrass jam. And she would take us up there and she'd give us $5 and we'd listen to these bluegrass players play. And that's a really important part of my heritage and my background. I know y'all have seen me on Sunday doing the jazz thing and playing with the quartet, but the roots of all that is bluegrass and country and folk. And I, I learned that stuff at my grandmother's knee in Kentucky. And she passed away last year. We and her and I were really, really close. But one of the reasons that I love doing this tent revival so much is, first of all, I don't get to play this stuff very often. There's not a whole lot of country saxophonists. <laughs> Secondly, it's just really beautiful music. And it has a really nice message. And we may not always agree with the message, but like the churches these songs sometimes ring out of, we can at least admire the architecture. Right? We can admire what it means and what it's saying. So let's play some music. What do you say? <laughs> That's as slow as you can go. <laughs> loved ones in the glory whose dear forms we all bless when you close your earthly story will you join them in their bliss will the circle be unbroken by and by There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. In the joyous days of childhood, off they told the wondrous love. Pointed to the dying Savior, now they dwell with Him above. The circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. You remember songs of heaven, which you sang with childish voice. Do you love the hymns they taught you, or the songs of earth, your choice? Will the circle be unbroken, by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Yeah. 
in kitchen Happy gatherings Round the fireside long ago And you think of A tearful party When they left you here below Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. One by one, their seats were empty. One by one, they went away. Now the family, family's party, it will be complete one day. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. This next one's called Angel Band. It was made famous by the Stanley Brothers, but we're going to have our sister Sharon Crimer singing for us. And I'll introduce everybody later on oh. so you can hear all these wonderfully talented people up here. Oh. You can talk some more. Yeah, just talk oh, they need me to talk some more. Second more. Just blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> One of the joys of this kind of music is that the tunes are easy to pick up and the choruses are repetitive which means that we can sing and the harmonies are really present. So as we continue to stall for Michelle to get all of her stuff together, I do encourage you, if you hear something that we sing tonight and you pick up the harmony, or you pick up the chorus, there is no shame. Sing it. Sing with us. None of this is just performance. This is about us and our voices joining together on these amazing songs. And if folks want to dance on the grass, <laughs> you're fine to do that too. <laughs> and Michelle is ready. <laughs> right, here we go. One, two, It's in the key of B. <laughs> <laughs> it's Listen, we're a very welcoming congregation. We tried multiple keys, didn't work, so we're going to stick with it. It's probably mine. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> triumph has begun oh come angel band come and around me stand bear me away on your snow white wings to my immortal home oh bear 
me away on your snow-white wings to my immortal friction before there's harmony. <laughs> Let me introduce the fine folks up here. On keys, Mark Schiffler. <laughs> On vocals and guitar, Michelle Dobsowitz. <laughs> Del Darling back here on drums. <laughs> Sharon Kreimer, whose lovely voice you just heard on Angel Band. Roger Geary on everything back here. <laughs> Resonator, <laughs> guitar, vocals. John Logier on harmonica and vocals. <laughs> Farmer Maley Reed here. <laughs> on bass and guitar. <laughs> Our reverends this evening, the Reverend Kimberly Davis. <laughs> the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. And our host this evening, the great conductor, Bob Fusen. Yeah. Dr. Bob. All right. We got one more, and then we'll get to the preaching. <laughs> yeah. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. What's the matter? I, something doesn't feel right about this song. What are you talking about? Well, I, I don't. It's not the music. It, it's, uh, I don't know, just something about the words, maybe. Maybe the words aren't right. What about it? Well, I, I don't know. What, is it almost kind of satanic or demonic? Mean, washed in the blood. Have you ever been washed in the blood? I wrestled in jello once. <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute. I would have won if you yeah, hadn't cheated. <laughs> okay. It does sound pretty gross. <laughs> it was. Well, and theologically, theologically problematic. Yes. What's your point? <laughs> well, it just seems like maybe we should be singing something fresh. You know, something new. I mean, because I, I don't see Unitarianism as an as a old-time religion, you know? It's, it, okay, it's been around for 300 years, but that's not old compared, you know, compared to some of the, some of the biggies, some of the big oldies. <laughs> you you going to wrap this up? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so I was thinking maybe, maybe we could do it more like this. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. It's really good for me. It was good for our mother. It was good for our fathers. It was good for none another. It's good enough for me. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. 
it's really, really good, good for me. me. It has served us injustice. It has served us injustice. It has served us injustice. It's really good for me. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. It's really good for me. It makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. It's really good for me. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. It's really good for me. It will take us all to Lincoln. It will take us all to Lincoln. It will take us all to Lincoln. It's really good for me. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. It's really good for me. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. Give me that new time religion. It's really good for me. Roger Geary. All right, so now we get to preaching. So now everybody falls asleep because it's nice and warm out here. <laughs> I should say, I didn't actually... Uh, I'm limping around up here. I, I walked a lot yesterday and yeah, tore up my you. foot, so I'm not actually hurt. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just old. Have you, have you tried washing it in blood? I have no. <laughs> Jello. Try Jello. <laughs> Ice cold. See what we've got in the church kitchen. So, <laughs> welcome to the second not quite annual Universalist Tent Revival at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. It has been two and a half years since our first annual Universalist Tent Revival. As we have said, I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair, this is the Reverend Kimberly Davis, this is the Dr. Bob Fusen, and the A Street Band. So this evening, you may find yourself under a tent, and you may tell yourself, this is not my beautiful church. These are not my beautiful hymns. And you may ask yourself, how is this fan in my hand? How did I get here? So this is a third Thursday service at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. We started doing these back in 2018. And every time we've done them, they've been a chance to play with what worship is, to try out different things, to try out different theologies, different liturgies, different music. And this is one of the ways that we do that. So when we did this for the first time back in October of 2018, first of all, it was not during graduation season, so we had matching tents. So thank you to everyone that has lent us tents. Out Nebraska has given us some tents for the night. Second Unitarian up in Omaha has given us some tents. The Pelters have given us some tents. We will need to return all of these. But also, We started back in, in 2018, after we did it that first time, we said, that was great, we should do it again. And then we started talking with our affiliate minister, Kimberly Debus, and said, gosh, we really need to get you out here to do one of these. Let's do it in May of 2020. <laughs> so that didn't happen. <laughs> so it has been a little while. But we are here. I do want to say a couple words about tonight while, you know, Sorry, we're getting situated and why we're doing this. You know, our, our faith, Unitarian Universalism, is non-creedal. This is not a Christian church. At a Unitarian Universalist church, you are at least as likely to hear a sermon preached with Mary Oliver as the text as you are the New Testament. 
that's an important part of who we are. But another important part of who we are is even though we are non-credal, even though we are a non-Christian faith, our two traditions, Unitarianism and Universalism, came out of American liberal Christianity. That is a distinct context with a distinct history. Both Unitarianism and Universalism, especially the latter, have histories and stories and myths tied up in Christian stories and myths. Those myths still have beauty to them. And part of what I'm interested in doing tonight and generally in Lincoln is reading them through the lens of our faith. Because they are our stories too. So put another way, I don't think the Lincoln Family Alliance gets to define what the Bible means in Lincoln, Nebraska. We get to do that too. So that's part of what we're going to be doing tonight. Because I think the Lincoln Family Alliance is often wrong, and I'll say that. But it's also important that we preach what we are about, how we interpret those stories. So we aren't seeing any talking heads tonight. That'll be a different third Thursday. But you might ask yourself what happened to your beautiful gospel songs. We changed them. You might notice that we change a word or two here and there as part of New Time Religion. We've taken out some gendered pieces of scripture. You may find yourself hearing a new thing, as scripture says. So welcome. The title of this service that we have been working on the last few months is My Heart is Ready, a Universalist Revival. So we'll start with that question. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah, it's not a rhetorical question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But Kimberly will answer. <laughs> yes. Right. Some of you know this, some of you don't, but you are invited to follow along and learn and sing as we go. My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? Oh God. My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? Now. Y'all are sitting there like the Frozen Chosen. <laughs> so when we get to the, oh God, I want you to do that. Oh God, with your bodies a little bit. Yeah. Oh God, my heart is ready and what am I going to do? My mind. My mind is ready and what am I going to do? My mind is ready and what am I going to do? My mind is ready and what am I going to do? Oh God. My mind is ready, and what am I going to do? My voice. My voice is ready, and what am I going to do? My voice is ready, and what am I going to do? My voice is ready, and what am I going to do? Oh, God. My voice is ready, and what am I going to do? One more for the heart. My heart is ready, and what am I going to do? My heart is ready, and what am I going to do? My heart is ready, and what am I going to do? Oh, God, my heart is ready, and what am I going to do? Yeah. And I think it's back to you, my friend. It is. So our reading tonight, first reading... We're going in deep, y'all. Yeah, we're just going to dive right in. The reading tonight is from the book of Revelation. <laughs> Chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Pretty deep. <laughs> One of the things I'll... Well, I guess I'm just going to preach a little bit first. One of the things that I learned in seminary that does not translate to Unitarian Universalism is that every single Sunday has a text assigned to it in what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. So in many Christian churches, the minister does not decide what to preach on. You pull out the list and you say, well, it's May 19th, year C. That's right. The text is Revelation 21. What am I going to say about that? So indeed, the texts tonight are the lectionary texts for this week. 
Our first reading is Revelation 21, 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. They will be God's peoples, and God himself will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And God said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then God said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of John of Patmos. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, oh, God's gonna trouble the water. Who's that young girl dressed in red, wait in the water? Must be the children that Moses led. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, who's that young girl? dressed in white wait in the water must be the children of the Israelites God's gonna trouble the water wait in the water in the water wait in the water children wait in the water Oh, God's, God's gonna, gonna trouble, trouble the water. Dressed in blue, wait in the water. Must be the children that are coming through. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. You don't believe I've been redeemed. Wait in the water. Just seen the Holy Ghost looking for me. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Thank you.
Getting really good at this. So are our waters troubled after reading Revelation in a UU church? <laughs> that one was a rhetorical question. <laughs> you know, my, my, uh, my Bible professor my first year in seminary used to say that, that everybody has this image of God as still waters running deep. But there are times when God is troubling the water when we read scripture where it's not a comforting thing, but a thing that we have to wrestle with and come to terms with. So the first song that the, the band played tonight, May the Circle Be Unbroken, starts with hope, but hope for an afterlife. So that's where we're going to start. There are loved ones in the glory whose dear forms you often miss. When you close your earthly story, will you join them in their bliss? Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. That's a powerful dream, right? A better home awaiting in the sky that we are here simply temporary travelers living in a world of woe, but destined for something else. Maybe up there. A place where, as Revelation puts it, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. This week, someone very dear to me started a hospice. And so let me tell you that there is, there is a part of me, no matter how many times I get up in that sanctuary at memorial services and say Unitarian Universalism makes cl no claim on what happens after death. There's a part of me that wants desperately to see a new heaven and a new earth, all of us reunited with our ancestors, tears wiped from eyes, the oil of gladness dissolving all mourning. I want that in part because that's, that's the story out there in the culture. That's the story of what Revelation means, right? At the end of the New Testament, the last few pages of the Christian Bible, there's this series of visions by a mystic named John of Patmos. They describe the end of the world, the apocalypse. And they end with this vision in Revelation 22 of a new heaven and a new earth, a holy city descending from on high. That story of how the world ends in Revelation is, is in the culture. We have movies and books about the apocalypse. It doesn't always look like Revelation. Sometimes it looks like a terrible movie about climate change that came out in the late 90s that I'm trying to remember the name of. The Day After. The Day After. But that idea is in the culture. And, and maybe it's because Revelation is in the culture. My interest in it is also likely informed by when I was in middle school, I, my, my family moved us from Michigan to New York. Um, and this is true. My, my best friend's family, as a going away present, gave me the first four books of the Left Behind book series. <laughs> in a desperate attempt, I think, to, to have one last chance to pull me in. <laughs> yep. But that story, that way of telling the story is not the only way to understand the book of Revelation. Because like every document in the Bible, every book, every chapter, it is a product of a time, a place, a context, an author. It didn't just appear out of the sky, it is grounded in a real place. Brian Blunt, a theologian, writes in, Can I Get a Witness Reading Revelation Through African American Culture that I did not come to my current fascination with Revelation naturally. Very little about the book speaks to the Christian interests that orient and shape my life, or so I once thought. During my one year as an educator and six years as a pastor of an African American Presbyterian church, I do not remember teaching or preaching out of the text more than once. 
On that single occasion, I believe I was drawn to the images of the new heaven and new earth as a metaphorical way of celebrating, and perhaps more importantly, encouraging the church's foray into a long needed but expensive building program. <laughs> I otherwise managed successfully to avoid any entanglements with it. But then the more I pored over the material, he writes, particularly from my conscious reading perspective as an African-American Christian, the more intrigued I became. I was fascinated by the oppressive context in which John understood himself and his church to exist. I found in that context a provocative correspondence with the long-standing and long-suffering circumstances of the African-American church. The invitation to do a commentary drew me to the work, but the perceived correspondence between John's history and the African-American church history convinced me to stay with it. Revelation, the book, the text, is a product of a context of oppression. The hope of a new heaven and a new earth descending from on high is not the hope of happy people hoping to re be reunited with family someday, happy people in suburban Michigan giving away copies of the Left Behind books. It is the hope of a small community under active legal oppression trying to figure out how to respond and what to make of where they have found themselves. And they do that through prophecy. So we misunderstand prophecy. Because prophecy in the Bible is not simply a prediction of what will be. That's a magic trick. Prophecy lives at the intersection of what might be and what ought to be. What is possible and what should. To take another example, the prophet Isaiah Famously writes, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn to war anymore. That's a prophecy. That's saying this thing will happen someday, but also this is the way things ought to be. And so when we read the, the prophet Isaiah saying beat swords into plowshares, we read it both as a promise for the future, but also as a directive of what we should do now to work for peace. Revelation is like that, a prescription for action now rather than a description of what will be. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. They will be God's peoples and God's self will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. That's not a magic trick. That's prophecy. That's what we could make. We are not passive recipients in the vision but participants in the community it describes. It's not up there, it's sometime, somewhere. It's about right in here, right now. So the question becomes, how do we do that? I am a poor Wayfair and stranger Traveling through This world of greed Where some have none They starve and stumble While others hoard More than they need I'm going home to help my neighbor I'm going home to do my part love depends 
on peace and justice. Peace begins in my own heart. Storm clouds may all around us gather and turn bright day to darkest night. With courage we will walk together and make our way back to the light. I'm going home to help my neighbor. I'm going home to do my part. Love depends on peace and justice. Peace begins in my own heart. words by folk singer Dan Berggren. So as we sit in this moment of peace and we breathe in deep, let us pray. Oh gracious and loving and forgiving God, we are all wayfaring strangers traveling through life with no guide but our faith, our intuition, and the company of those around us. We encounter so much pain in our world, greed and hate and selfishness and oppression. We live our days surrounded by those who would seek to control or isolate or destroy those they consider the other. 
we find ourselves overwhelmed by the deep wounds of disease, natural disaster, climate change. Great mystery, we ask that you open our eyes that we may see glimpses of truth, glimpses of healing, moments of grace and comfort, evidence of the moral arc of the universe bending, and more. Spirit of life, come unto us. Stir in our hearts compassion. Stir in our minds a vision of beloved community. Stir in our bodies the energy and strength to make manifest the justice and equality and healing and liberation we all so desperately need. Our prayers are many, and many of them are written on the tablets of our hearts. And as our prayers are strengthened in community, praying together, our prayers are strengthened when we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Join with me now in the language of your knowing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Ashe, blessed be. Amen. On earth, as it is in heaven. As the passage from the Revelation, and as Oscar, Oscar notes, this new heaven is not in the sky, Lord, in the sky. It's here. Or, well, it could be. Heck, it could have been here by now if people had actually followed the commandment that Jesus left us with. A commandment so important and so central that it is written in all of the Gospels but perhaps most eloquently in the Gospel of John. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. Love one another. Repeat it with me. Love, love one, one another. another. So, pretty simple. Okay, we're done. Love one another, right? <laughs> Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> simple, right? Yeah, love one another. Right, sure. <laughs> Maybe not so simple. Should <coughs> it should be. <laughs> well, because if it were that simple, everyone would do it, and the new heaven would be here on Earth. This glorious planet we call home. Oh, wait. <laughs> We messy humans keep forgetting to love one another. We have been forgetting to do this since humans first discovered the heady rush of power and control, the comfort of selfishness and greed, the fear of scarcity, of harm and difference. We forgot that our communities are stronger when we love one another, healthier, more compassionate, more equitable, more just. We forgot. And the sages have been telling us this for millennia, over and over again, throughout all of the civilizations of the world. The prophets and the sages have seen the human messiness at its most ugly, at its most evil, and have tried to persuade us to something better. The Greek philosopher Plato noticed a need to be right that was overtaking the need to connect. And he wrote extensively about how we should speak to one another, that it needed to be conducted in a kindly, compassionate manner and would not bring transcendent insight unless exchanged in good faith and without malice. We see a similar thought from Confucius who understood that we, we must bring softness, and pliability and vulnerability and be willing to yield to one another. 
The Buddha took this even further, noting that when people begin from a point of egotism, of self, they tend to dig in their heels and leave the messy things messy. He suggested that instead they should reflect that everyone else feels the same too, and maybe a person that loves themselves should not harm the self of others because they love themselves too. In other words, remembering that if I have inherent worth and dignity, so do you, so does everyone else. When the world is so broken, we must return to that greater truth. <sighs> no, it's not easy. The Taoists point out that we often identify with our needs and our experiences and our ideas and our ego so strongly that we feel personally assaulted if they're criticized. We tend to bludgeon each other into seemingly irreparable conflict, refusing to make space for one another. Which is one thing, certainly, when it's between two people, but it's certainly something else when it's between communities or nations. Paul of Tarsus, who learned the lessons of Jesus, noticed this too, that the human compulsion towards strife and discrimination, greed and malevolence was obscuring Jesus' very clear commandment to love one another. <clears throat> and because of this, he writes that famous passage about love found in 1 Corinthians 13, one of Paul's letters to one of the congregations in the early Jesus movement. Paul spills a great deal of ink explaining to his flock and to us that we have to love one another because if we do not have love, we are nothing. If we do not have love, we are nothing. But then he tells us what love is, what it looks like, and what a thing it is. Paul tells us that love is patient and kind and doesn't envy. Love isn't proud, it isn't rude, it isn't pushy or resentful, no. Love bears all things, including all the messiness of our lives, hopes all things for a better way, endures all things, struggles and keeps the faith when the God has troubled the waters. Love is the fuel for compassion, Love is the fuel for justice. Love is the fuel for healing. Love is the fuel for abundance. Love is the freedom, fuel for freedom. Love is the fuel for liberation. Love is the fuel for the new heaven here on earth. What we keep doing wrong, so we don't love each other. We might say we have love, but we don't love each other. We have missed out on loving each other into beloved community, into the new heaven, over and over and over and over again for millennia. We miss out on loving in our closest relationships, our congregations, our communities, our locales, our nation, our world, our planet. When we don't love each other, evil is allowed to exist. Let me repeat that. When we don't love each other, evil is allowed to exist. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. And it seems like we can't do anything about it, even if we think we have love. <sighs> even when lots of people think they have love. Last weekend, over a million people marched in opposition to the draft decision striking down Roe v. Wade. Will a million people change the minds? A million people change the minds of five Supreme Court justices, it likely won't. And over and over, we see hundreds and thousands of millions of people declaring the vision of beloved community and getting nowhere. The new heaven not only seems out of reach, it seems to be getting further away from us at each passing moment. It's just two nights ago, about 25 of us gathered, <coughs> And we considered some of our hymns. And we saw how in just 30 years, 
the moral arc of the universe has bent a little bit toward justice. We're more sensitive to gender issues, to colonization and triumphalism, to ableism, to cultural sensitivities. We can see the progress of 30 years. It's small. But the moral arc doesn't bend easily like a weeping willow. It bends more gently like a very tall pine tree. And sure, that's just a handful of people seeing what happens when we, when we what? Love, Love one, one another. another, right. But when we understand that salvation is not personal, but collective, that the new heaven is not about me seeing my family, but us seeing true beloved community. We understand that the beloved community and salvation itself is the collective, it's all about us. And then, then we can understand how you and you and you and you and me too, which means all of us have a part in this. Unitarian minister Edward Everett Hale wrote, I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. We must do something. What must we do? Love one another. We must do as Jesus commanded us to. We must do what healing asks us to do. Love one another. We must do what justice asks us to do. Love one another. We must do what liberation asks us to do. Love one another. What must we do? Love one another. Yes. And Dan Berggren, who is an Adirondack folk singer and songwriter, reminds us that maybe Angel Band isn't the right set of words for this beautiful tune. And he grounds us in the work that is ours to do. <laughs> Kindred spirits gather around, friends sing a gospel song. Lives may be lost, but souls are found. We hear them sing along. Oh, come, amazing grace. Come now and fill this place. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. Help us be mindful. might be the spirit <laughs> singing along with us good stories shared of things we've done enrich our harmony the hardships we have overcome become our victory oh come Amazing grace, come now and fill this place. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. water, made of air, made of earth and fire. To love and be loved is our prayer, our holiest desire. Oh, come amazing grace, come now and fill this place. Help us be mindful and use each day a better home. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. 
listen up. Dan's going to tell you what to actually do. We share the load. We do our part for neighbor, stranger, friend. Open minds and open hearts can bring us peace again. Oh, oh come amazing grace. Come now and fill this place. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. Oh, come amazing grace, come now and fill this place. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. Help us be mindful and use each day to make a better home. So the script here says, invitation, Oscar, nine minutes. <laughs> How do we make a better home? Just for that. <laughs> you are all invited, if you are so moved, to give to the programming of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Yeah. You can do that by texting UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. There, I have done the invitation. Well, there's a song that we didn't actually use in this service. We thought about it, but um, it's 11 minutes long and um, has a lot of words, and Bob and Kimberly vetoed it. Um, you can thank us later. <laughs> but it, it plays for eight of those minutes with this metaphor of a city descending on high and how we have hope. It's a little wordy. But there's this line right at the end. I wondered what it was I've been looking for up above. Heaven's so big there ain't no need to look up. I mentioned earlier tonight that someone dear to me just started hospice. My grandmother is dying. Aww. We learned last week that her cancer is inoperable. And that's sad for us as a family. Okay. Let me tell you about Sue Powell for a minute. Sue Ann Knox was born in the mid-1930s just outside of Chicago. She was the eldest daughter of a Methodist minister, and she spent the first 18 years of her life moving from town to town in the middle of nowhere, Illinois, <laughs> every time my great-grandfather, Ken Knox, got a new call. He was not very popular in the Methodist church. He did a lot of union organizing, so they kept moving him around <laughs> every couple of years. And Sue Knox's first love was music playing piano and organ at her, at her father's churches, some music like this, eventually going to Cornell College in Iowa as a music student where she met her second love, Milt Powell. They married, had four kids, would have had more, but as she tells it, the pill became generally available <laughs> right about the time kid number four was born. <laughs> She held on to her Methodism for a long time. She volunteered at her church, played music, served on committees, helped to hire a new minister. And then when the church in East Lansing, Michigan decided to stay segregated in practice, she quit the church and organized religion altogether. And then my grandma Sue went back to school after her kids were old enough to take care of themselves. She became one of the first social workers in, in East Lansing, Michigan in the school district, meeting one-on-one -on -one with students who desperately needed someone to listen to them. She raised four kids, four grandkids, volunteered in her community until just a few years ago and every single day 
built a better world, and every single day played the piano. What are we called to do? Love one another. And if the church isn't doing that fast enough, well then to hell with the church. <laughs> we'll do it without him. So I'm supposed to end with an invitation here. This is usually where an altar call would be in a revival. We seem to be missing an altar. We missed that in the setup. I'm certain we haven't converted anyone tonight. Maybe. 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 But think about that song that we started with, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? We're not asking you tonight to believe in a better home up there in the sky or we will all be united with our ancestors. That I believe that circle is unbroken in the stories that we tell and in the lives that we live and in ways that we cannot possibly understand yet. I am universalist enough to believe that. But that's not the message tonight. The message tonight is to think about the world that we can make together when we love one another. The home that reflects everything that we have talked about tonight, all of that collective action. Think about that. And then remember that every piece of collective action is made up of individual actions. It doesn't just happen. Prophecies aren't a magic trick because they require lots of people doing little things every single day, playing the piano, working in schools, walking a long way and getting horrific blisters on their feet. <laughs> that is what is required of us. So here's the invitation. Here's the altar call. What is it for you? Not, I'm going to live a better life. Do that. Be blessed in doing it. But what are you going to do? Tonight. What are you going to do this week? What are you going to do this month? What are you going to do this year? These are not rhetorical questions. You don't need to shout out the answers. But as the last song plays, think about those answers and then go forth and do them. Because that's how it happens. That's the new heaven and earth. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Brother. Oh, come amazing grace, come now and fill this place. Help us to be mindful and use each day to make a better home. So that's the invitation. Come amazing grace and help us to use each day to build a better home. And then maybe Having so big, there ain't no need to look up. That's right. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Yes, we need to love one another. And Brother Oscar asked, what are you going to do tonight? You can start by helping us tear all this stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. <laughs> thank you, really, all of you for being here. Just a couple things. One, we would love your help tearing this stuff down. Two, the Nebraska Chamber Players, please be respectful. They're in the sanctuary. We talked a lot about faith and religion tonight. Well, let me tell you about my religion, which is good music. Can I get an amen for that? Amen, amen brother. And you want to talk about love. I love these people up here. I you. say it every time we have one of these, I have the best job in Lincoln, and it's because of these folks. Right here. How about a round of applause for the A Street Band? All right. Let's play some music and get out of here. What do you say? Yeah. There are loved ones in the glory whose dear form we often miss when you close your earthly story will you join them in their bliss Sing it with us. will the circle be unbroken by my lord by and by there's a better home awaiting in the sky lord
Lord in the sky. In the joyous days of childhood, off they told of wondrous love. Pointed to the dying Savior, now they dwell with him up above. In the circle, be unbroken, by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. You remember songs of heaven, which you sang with childish voice. Do you love the hymns they taught you? Or our songs of earth, your choice. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Round the fireside long ago, and you think of tearful partings when they left you here below. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. One by one their seats were empty, one by one they went away. Now the family is parted, will it be complete one day? Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better way to live now. There's a better Way to live we can now. have it if we try. We can have it if we try. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better, a better way, way to live now. We can We can have it. Street Band.